What did they study there? What did they do? Did they make beads? Did they make things out of flowers? Well, no. As a matter of fact, and that is an astonishing thing, that there was a group of people who said that we will come together and we will start studying those things. Matema. They will study those things. And what was okay. <laughs> he came up with this astonishing, and it's truly astonishing if you consider it, idea that mathematics is the universal language which could explain reality everywhere. Then you say, well, we know it. Well, we know it because he told us so. And when he told us so, nobody believed it. It was raving of a lunatic who went to, you know, some Indian place, you know, didn't eat meat, obviously, and I was crazy. So, but he came up with the central tenet of Pythagorean belief that mathematics is central to our understanding of the world. It's the center of our intellectual world that we have to study it. And uh, they started, literally, developing a broad view of what mathematics is. So they developed, which for centuries remained the core curriculum of higher education throughout Europe. It's called quadrivium, four disciplines. And what is quadrivium? Astronomy. You look at the stars. They go, you know, stars go. And to understand astronomy, you map it into geometry, the signs of shapes, which would explain to us how stars go. And then the part of a great program of Pythagoreans, and we shall see, especially during the second journey, that it was a, not a simple thing and led to a lot of intellectual crisis uh, for, for thousands of years. We will map shapes into numbers, because again, Pythagoreans believe that number is the key to everything. And then, Final step, we will put numbers into music because disciples of Pythagoras knew this remarkable thing about him, that for him it all connected. He could hear the music of the spheres. You see, when planets move around in the sort of, there is this music of the numeric relationship generated. And most of us just do not hear it because we are accustomed. It's a background noise. But he could. He could hear the music of the sphere. You say it might not be true. Maybe it is not. But it is beautiful, isn't it? So he could hear the music of the spheres. And he clearly was the first person who came up with mathematical theory of music. So music, instead of just, you know, boogie-woogie, became this mathematical discipline. Sort of the structure of the octave was discovered by Pythagoras. This is very clear. That was one of his fundamental discoveries, that sort of the real relation of string length and, and, uh, and the octave. So mathematical theory of music. So the ashram was not a bad thing. I mean, you watch the stars, you do mathematics, you listen to Bach, you know, celibacy. That's all right. Huh? You know, there are at least a friend of mine who says that the only way people will do mathematics if they are rewarded by sex. Apparently not. Uh, sort of for Pythagoreans, they were willing to abandon everything in search of this beautiful eternal truth. And uh, again, sort of, we know another sort of thing about them, which is going to be, I'm going to make a very controversial statement because it's about Pythagoras. 
there are, of course, two ways of looking at things. We could say we should do mathematics because it's good for profitability. Or we could say we should have profitability because it's good for mathematics. Now, Pythagoras actually took very clear second statement. He said that this is why we do everything. And it was shocking because he took arithmetic, what was considered to be stuff financial guys do, and said, this is the supreme thing which should be studied for its own sake. And somehow it will make us better. This is still a thing which we argue. Because every time people discuss, why should we study mathematics? You have to construct this argument that it will increase, decrease the bug count, or whatever. There will be some practical outcome. And since I proudly say that I'm an old Pythagorean, I say, no, it's the primary thing. That the bug count will decrease. Yes, there will be some good benefits. But it's still the primary thing we should study it for is because that's the wonderful thing to know. Right? I'm allowed occasionally to say things like that. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we do not have any Pythagorean texts. As we shall see later on, that of one of the limitation of the brotherhood was that they were sworn to secrecy. Again, you know, some people think that keeping your results secret will make you more competitive. So they thought so. That's why they perished, by the way. And this is why their results are not known to us directly, because none of the texts of Pythagorean schools survive. We have later texts which are very likely based on their, on their text, but not their texts. So it was a secret mathematics, proprietary mathematics, if you like, using modern terms. And they had one more thing, which I actually love. You see, you were supposed to come up with new theorems but you were not supposed to claim credit. The credit went to Pythagoras himself, even after he was long dead. So what you would say, ipsum dixit, I mean, he said, you would attribute all the results to him, which eliminated this nagging, terrible thing of fighting for the credit, which is truly annoying. Uh, so that was something very, very good about Pythagoreans. Secrecy was not helpful, however. So uh, how could I tell you, since you know, whatever we're going to be talking about comes from their, their mathematics, there is a difficulty. Fortunately, we have a relatively late text, and text quite beautiful. And those of you who want to know a little bit more about it might consider reading it. It's by uh, Nicomachus of Giraza. Anybody knows where Giras is? Gira, you cannot Google, no laptop. Giras is located, well, about uh, 20 miles east of the Sea of Galilee. He was a Palestinian. Uh, and, well, some of you might have heard the books called Gospels. And, there is this story about Gerizim demoniacs, or demoniac in Mark, the guy who had legion in him. Yeah? Okay. Uh, once upon a time, people knew. Uh, whatever. So he comes from Gerasa and uh, wrote just about one thing we know, wrote a bunch of books on arithmetic. He wrote a very introductory book. That's the one we still have. And then he wrote an advanced text for freshmen, say. But we have his introductory text su surviving. And it is a quite a marvelous text. Uh, it's 
it's easily obtainable for about 10 bucks if you buy it as a volume. Great Books of the Western World, published by Britannica, there is a volume which contains it. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful little text on, on arithmetic. But uh, the most interesting results I'll present. So, uh, Pythagoreans observed that numbers had geometric shape. This is one of their intuitive concepts that a number in integer could be affiliated with a particular shape. For example, they discovered things which they called triangular numbers. Uh, it should be self-evident why they called them triangular numbers because they sort of look like triangles. And uh, they are interesting numbers because you see, if you start looking at them, you observe, you observe that they're actually, every triangular number is a sum, where is my, is a sum of 1, or 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Right? This sort of consecutive sums. Uh, and I'm very proud of my ability to typeset that. Uh, they couldn't. Greeks didn't have tech. That was their one shortcoming. Uh, but they did write them with alphas. So this is literally from, from the Greeks. So how do we prove this formula? You see, Greeks observed that if you have triangular numbers, then there is another kind of numbers called oblong numbers. You see, an oblong number is a triangular number on top of another triangular number. And here we see this wonderful relation. We see that this sum, which we need, remember it was one of your homeworks, hopefully you did it real well, uh, so to come up with geometric proof of this sum, they observed geometrically that doubling this sum is equal to n to n plus 1, which is literally self-evident. Right? I mean, it's right there. And therefore, you could divide it by 2 and get the the formula, the formula for triangular numbers. They loved all kinds of numbers. For example, they invented numbers called gnomons. Gnomon is a thing which they use in a sundial. Gnomon. It's also, you know sundials? Well, of course, you need to turn it the other way around to work in a sundial. It's also the word which we'll use for a carpenter square. So they will study gnomon numbers. Observe that a gnomon number is equal to well, it's either one or it's the next odd number because it's two n minus one. Why two n? Because you have top uh, uh, horizontal and perpendicular component, and one minus one because one guy you count twice. So very simple. So nth gnomon is of the size 2n minus 1. This is a formula for gnomon. And then comes this beautiful thing. You, know, you could stack the gnomons like so. You know, this is just you know, so, so wonderful. And if you stack them, you get this great formula. And you don't need to prove it by induction because Again, it's self-evident. It's the proof is right in front of you. That is, the sum of first n odd numbers is equal to the n square, which is just just wonderful. Right? And that's that's the proof which uh, um, Nicomachus presents. Then finally, they and this is sort of you have to understand what they do. They look at all kinds of numbers triangular numbers, oblong numbers, square numbers, and try to classify them. They come with all kinds of interesting problems. Right I, when I was working on these slides, I stumbled upon, by accident, 
the following very nice problem appears in Plutarch, a great philosopher historian, uh, which, uh, which you should try to do. He says that if you take any triangular number, multiply it by 8, and add 1, you will get a square number. Okay? You have to find a geometric proof. If you do algebraic transformations, that's cheating. Okay? I think I mean, it's a lot, lot, I mean, the picture is beautiful. Uh, I cannot show it to you because we're giving away the house. So, and then finally they stumbled on numbers which they cannot make into any shape. Right? Shapeless numbers, numbers which could be just not made into a square or oblong or things like that. Prime numbers, again. For them, prime numbers became very, very interesting. By the way, this is the sequence. And some people doubt it, but it starts with 2. Uh, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and so on. So that was a remarkable sort of discovery, because as we shall see, prime numbers are central to actually practical applications. But that's what you have to, you know, I'll be talking about it. You do not know what will be practically useful. Because you have to go on a limb, as it were. Because they were not looking for public key encryption. Right? They, they had some other goals, understanding numbers. And they said, let us see how, prior, how, you know. And they started, again, we will talk about Euclid to considerably greater detail. I save him for the second journey. So you have to believe that he existed. So there is a couple of wonderful results on prime numbers in Euclid. Um, by the way, it's not commonly known, but Euclid is not just a book on geometry. It's also a book on number theory. Euclid has 13 books, two of which are strictly number theory books. So uh, one of the results which we will need is the following result. Any number is either prime or divisible by some prime. You say, well, but it's self-evident. Well, maybe not. So here we see the first example of a very profound proof techniques discovered by the Greeks, which is the argument of infinite descent. It is Greeks postulated, and it is, if you like, an axiom that you cannot have an ever-decreasing sequence of natural numbers. It just cannot be done. You say, well, how do you prove it? Well, you don't. In some sense, as we shall see later, it is exact equivalent of the inductive axiom of Peano when we get to that. So it's a very, very fundamental principle. And for Greeks, this idea of impossibility of infinite descent is very important. We shall see later that it actually led to some profound, profound disappointment. But in this context, it works wonderfully because what he says, if you take an infinite sequence of numbers, if, if it's not so, you will get an infinite sequence of numbers. How does it go? You take a number. It's either prime. If it's prime, we're done, yes? If it's not prime, it means that it has a divisor different from itself by definition of a prime, yes? And one. So we pick that one. If it is a prime, we're done. If not, it has a divisor. So we start coming up with a sequence, ever-decreasing sequence of numbers. It must stop. Right? So this is this argument which is of very fundamental nature. We will see it time and time again. Sort of th think about it. This is deep stuff in some sense. I mean, it's simple, but you know, some simple things are actually deep. And then... He comes with one of the most remarkable theorems in all of mathematics. Some people say the most beautiful theorem in all of mathematics. I don't know. There are many beautiful theorems. But Euclid tells us that there are infinitely many primes. Right? This is, we don't know how many primes. Maybe they stop. Maybe you reach 100,000, and after that, all the numbers are composite. Right? 
And you can say, well, we could check experimentally. Well, guys, no, we cannot check experimentally because experimentally we'll check up to a certain number. And maybe after that number, there'll be no more primes. We could, of course, say, and so on, but it doesn't work. So Euclid realizes that you need to prove that there are infinitely many primes. Right? He doesn't, Greek, avoid like plague term infinity. So he doesn't say that. He says, if you have a finitely many primes, there is one more, which is equivalent, right? So, and the proof is truly remarkable. So let's assume that you have n primes. Somebody gave them, Tom. He, he has many primes. So Tom gives you a bunch of primes. Then you could generate one more. How? You multiply all Tom primes together and add one. Now, this number q is not going to be divisible by any p. Because if it were, then one will be divisible by, 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 by it, right? Because, you know, there is this wonderful law, uh, wonderful theorem Euclid already proved, that if two numbers are divisible by something, then their difference is divisible by it. Right? So, he knows that Q cannot be divisible. Therefore, there are infinitely many primes. It's, this is, again, something which we should cherish because it's, it's, really, it's really one of these sort of existence theorems. It, it's constructive because he gives you a mechanism for getting the next prime. By the way, Q is not prime. Q may or may not be a prime. That is a very good point Tom makes. Sort of Q, oh sorry. Q is not guaranteed to be a prime. It's guaranteed to be divisible by a prime different from any of this. Right? So we could get another prime. Thank you, Tom. Now, uh, the next result, this is interesting, sort of. Uh, I have to introduce another person in spite of the fact that the result of which we're going to be talking about uh, appears in this text of uh, uh, Nicomachus, right? But he attributes it to a great scholar, Eratosthenes. Sort of somebody again, you know, I wish there was a stamp. One of the reasons there is no stamp is that he was a little bit unfortunate. He was born in a place called Cyrene. Where is Cyrene? Northern Africa, it's actually, he's the first great Libyan mathematician. And that's his sort of downfall. Apparently, Muammar Gaddafi didn't want to have a stamp uh, of this guy. I mean, he, Cyrene is a Greek colony in Libya, ancient colony. Again, there is a clear biblical reference. Simon of Cyrene. Anybody knows who Simon of Cyrene was? No. No, Simon is Cyrene. Uh, okay, according to all the synoptic gospels, he was the guy who helped Jesus to carry the cross. So we know that there were some Jews in Cyrene, and there was indeed a large Jewish colony. Uh, so this guy grew up in Libya and then went to study in Athens. Athens was sort of the old intellectual center, where, there was, according to some rumors, he started with Zeno. Zeno was the founder of Stoics. And Stoics were the people who would walk on the porch. Porch in Greek is stoa. That's why they're called Stoic. I think it's because they're like stoical. No, it's the other way around. They're just people who walk on the porch. And so he started with Zeno. And later on, got a very nice job offer because there was a new emerging intellectual power in the world, which very quickly became the central place for every intellectual to be, which was called 
Alexandria. Yes, very good. So he moves to Alexandria. He gets an offer from Ptolemy. At that time, kings literally personally wanted to recruit top mathematicians. So he goes there and maybe very likely becomes the head of the library. Being the head of library of Alexandria, this is big deal, guys. This is really big deal. And a great, great scientist, his sort of most remarkable accomplishment is, of course, measuring the Earth. He manages to find out the circumference of the Earth with about 1% to 2% margin. That's not bad. Try it in your spare time. I mean, you know, he, he actually came up with the method, com complete, absolutely astonishing scientist. A uh, great geographer, he wrote a classical book on ancient geography, not extant. Uh, the, we have just one of his letters extant, uh, which is a remarkable letter to his uh, boss, the pharaoh, uh, about cubic root, so how to get cubic root of two. Uh, very, very beautiful. Uh, He's very proud. He came up with a sort of geometrical algorithm for finding it. Not a ruler in compass. That you cannot do with a ruler in compass. Uh, did many other things. Sadly enough, he was known as beta. Everybody would say, oh, he's just a beta. You see, it's unfortunate. He's probably one of the like 10 greatest scientists who ever lived. He was unfortunately was a contemporary of Archimedes. This is this sort of a good friend of Archimedes. Archimedes dedicated a couple of his books to him. So they were good friends, but affected sort of Eratosthenes' uh, self-esteem, I guess. I don't know whether it actually affected this, but people called him beta since he wasn't quite alpha. So, but some betas apparently are quite good. Uh, and uh, uh, there is, well, so what did he invent? He invented this wonderful thing called the sieve. This is the way of generating prime numbers, which is still quite, quite remarkable now. Now, I'm going to tell you the way it is described in uh, Nicomachus and which is different from the way it was described in your textbooks, because they Greeks, they wanted to optimize space. And uh, they were algorithmically more advanced than modern textbooks. So they decided that it's actually pointless to store even numbers in the sieve, because they sort of figured out they already knew all prime numbers which were even. So first, they write all the numbers. Then what do they do? They start with 9. We shall see why they start with 9. Because you see, they figured out that you could start with a square of whatever one you're doing, because everything below the square is not a prime. So they start with 9 and go with step 3, throwing things out. Step 3 actually happens to be step 6. Because they're storing only odd numbers. They're storing half the numbers. So, you know, 12 is not there. So if they go by step 3, they go directly to 15. Pay attention to that. That's the important fact. So then the next three takes you to 21. You're skipping 18. It's not in the table. Then you go to 27, and so on. Okay? Then you pick <coughs> the next possible contender at and start with its square. Because everybody before the square was crossed already. We will see in greater detail in a second. So you go 25, 35, step 5 
It's actually step 10 because these are only odd numbers. 25, 35, 45, so on. Yes? They cross the stuff and then 7 and so on. Right? So now some C++. So uh, even if you don't know what random access iterator is, assume that you do. This is something which allows you random indexing, sort of allows you random jump. And to do the sieve, it's really important to do random jumps. Why? Because we jump by ever increasing steps. So implementing sieve in a linked list is not a good idea. So use something which have random access. This is very, very simple piece of code, which is basically says, while you didn't out outrun the last, keep increasing by step and marking it with false. Okay? And if you don't know how while statement works, you remember John and the new I expert, they could tell you. So, uh, and then we need a couple of math things to fully, to write the code fu fully, fully well. Uh, first of all, we need to know that the square of the smallest prime factor is less than n. That is, basically, this is the, the reason that we always need to start with a square. That if the number has been crossed by previous sifting, the, you know, it doesn't have devices if, 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 if it's less than, than the square. Uh, because any composite number less than p square is sifted by a prime less than p. Right? And so when sifting by p, start marking at p square. And then if table is of size m, stop sifting when p square is greater than m. Nothing to sift. These are sort of lemmas which we use to write this code. Uh, except we need to do little, little mathematics. Uh, so what is, this is just tells you what is the value in the position i? And if we go back, we see that the value at position i is 3 plus 2 i's. Let us see here. It becomes self-evident. What we see, we start with 3 in position 0. So if we're in position i, we're going to make step 2 i times. Everybody agrees with that? So the position, the person who logically lives in the position i is 3 plus 2i or using commutativity, 2i plus 3. Now, position of where is value v resides is just we reverse the thing. It's v minus 3. What is distance to 3? divided by 2. That's what it is. Now, steps between multiples of p, and it basically equal to p. That's the, after we do simple, simple arithmetic. And then we need to figure out where is position of square of value at i. Remember, that's where we need to start sifting at a square. And if we are sifting by p, which resides at position i, then its square will be residing in position 2i squared plus 6i plus 3. This is simple algebra. There is nothing deep there. Okay. Of course, now it appears to be sort of confusing. Any, any algebra appears confusing when you listen. But 
go home and check. It's, it's correct. Or so I say. Think about the joy of finding that I actually made terrible mistakes. Then you could send to the list saying, and Alex was wrong about this. Yes, and I'll be humiliated and jump off the roof. So, uh, so now it allows me to write the following piece of code. So I start with i, and I keep another variable called square. That's where square of i is. And while square of, you see, just let's, let's, who lives in position zero? Three. Who lives in position one? Five. Who lives in position two? Seven. Who lives in position three? Three, nine, who is our square? Just showing you that I am not making it up. I do not know why I got on the same line as square. It was not supposed to. Uh, somebody please send me email. I will correct it. Uh, so, and at this point, we establish the invariant that square lives in, in this thing. It's a bit true. And then what we do, we mark sieve from first plus square, from square position, to first plus n, that's where the last is, and then our step is i plus i plus 3. Then we raise square uh, when we multiply i and recompute the square. We're using Horner rule to write this polynomial. And here, this is this interesting thing. We see how Greek mathematics allows us to use modern compiler optimization. Because this is not, code is not optimal. Why? Because we're doing too much stuff right here, computing this square. It's just really annoying to do that much stuff. Alex, I mean, it doesn't matter. It will take milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, some seconds. Well, it takes some time which doesn't have to be taken. So let us try to rewrite it. And there is a standard technique for doing it which used to be taught, it's no longer taught, it's known as strength reduction. So let us just do this first before we do strength reduction. So what, what I do first is I just slightly modify the code by saying, you know, I'll take these steps uh, and keep step as an explicit variable. See, I was, you just let me show you. I was computing step every time through the loop, right? Instead of computing it every time through the loop, which required two additions, let me keep it as a variable. Sort of the one important way is sort of always try to see whether introdu introducing these additional variables and then studying their relation will improve this step. So what we observe is that we just stop computing last. We just compute it once. We hoist this expression out of the loop. So we take common sub-expression and hoist it out. You see where we put it? Right in the beginning. We never need to do it. And again, you say, compiler will do it. You do not know anything about compiler. It most likely will do something, but not enough. If you do it, it will be done. Plus, we'll see at the end the code will be prettier. Sort of one of the important ways of making code pretty is trying different compiler optimization. So we hoisted last out, and then we made step into a variable, which we initialized to 3, and then in the loop, we recomputed. Say, well, I mean, it's, it's sort of same computation. 
Oh, you wait, you wait. Give me, give me a chance. So now we sort of read what strength reduction is. And fundamental idea of strength reduction is replacing multiplication by addition, re replacing power by multiplication, which is reducing the difficulty of the operation to the previously, to a less difficult operation by introducing an extra induction variable. It's a general technique. Sort of, you have to learn to, to, to sort of do it. And sometimes you say, well, it's not necessary. My code is not executed often enough. It's a good thing to practice. It's a good thing. So we do the full. So the idea is that we replace the computation of this step, which is two addition with one addition by introducing some delta step. And we replace computation of the square, which is a heady expression, with introducing of this delta. Of course, we need to figure out what they are. And that's how we figure out what they are. We actually see what is the delta step. We know that the position it's 2i plus 3 here and the next position is going to be 2i plus 1 plus 3 right so it grows up by 2 it's just very simple it's a constant here we need to do a little bit more because we know that this is this quadratic polynomial minus this quadratic polynomial and it comes to be 4i plus 8. And a friend of mine says, well, everybody will stop here. Nobody will keep looking. He actually used the term. It will take me 2 million years to find the next step. He is mistaken for the following reason. The following reason is that you have to know a simple rule. You know which variables you have and what you are going to have. That is, you know that you are going to have current step and next step in the loop. You're going to have current square and next square. There are just not that many different possibilities. So you look at how to express them in terms of each other in the most minimal, beautiful way. And apparently you see 4i plus 8 is equal to 2i plus 3 plus 2i plus 2 plus 3, which is actually, apparently, equal 2i plus 3 plus 2i plus 1 plus 3. Look up there. These are my, my positions in this step, right? So this guy, 2i plus 3, is my step i, and this guy is my step plus 1. You know, it just so happens. By the way, you can ask, Alex, did you really expect it? No, I didn't expect it, but I know there is always something pretty. I didn't know whether it would be this or something like this. You have to look. And that now allows us to really simplify the code dramatically. Because what we do is we do just mark C, then we increment I, then we increment square, by this step, when we increment step by 2, then we increment square by step. Right? That is, all of this polynomial stuff is gone. No more multiplications and very few additions, and every addition is necessary. Right? It's sort of, in any case, you have, you have to stare at the stuff, but you know, at some sense, in some sense, let me tell you the following thing. Programming is a wonderful activity, like mathematics. It allows you to have this innocent joy. I mean, you spend some time, you look at the code, you find a minimal representation, and you feel good. Even if your boss doesn't appreciate it, you still feel good. You know, and even if you change jobs, you still feel good because it's with you. Nobody could take it away from you. So, 
and, and the, you force the reader of this code to yes. understand the mathematics. I do, which is good. So, in any case, sort of you have to you have to put all of this uh, writing there, and I did. Uh, so, uh, in any case, problem. What we need to figure out, and this is very very interesting experiment. We haven't done it yet, but I want eventually to encourage you to to start doing measurements. You see, the sieve could live as a bit, as a byte, as a two-byte quantity, right? And there are complexity trade-off. It's very trivial to now to try it with, with a bit, use vector of bull. You say, well, but wouldn't it be the, the fastest? No, because bit surgery is actually relatively slow. You will shrink it, but you will be using more instruction. But on the other hand, it might fit in cash. So there is an interesting studying this is, is an interesting problem. Or it could be one byte. Then, of course, it's not going to be aligned, whether alignment matter. Or you could go up. So try to figure out how it works. It's not difficult. But I think it's quite instructive. Is a vector of pool actually a bit vector? Or is, will it be the same as you would No, it's a bit vector. I mean, it's, you know, one bull occupies one bit. So, no, otherwise it wouldn't be very interesting. Um, the question is, should it be vector of bull? That's another story. I don't want to go into that. Sort of whether the name is a good name. That's but if you like, come, you know why I sit and I'll tell you the story behind the name and all of this stuff. Uh, now, we have now a very interesting equipment. We could generate lots of prime numbers. I gave you the code. It really works. Now try to figure out how they are distributed. And try to guess a formula. You say, Alex, you really want us to prove prime number theory. No, I really don't want you to prove it. But I want you to try to guess it. One of the important skills is to learn to guess formulas. So now you could generate lots of prime numbers with a sieve. And you could see how many in the first thousand, how many in the second thousand. You could graph them and say, this graph looks like this. Is it going to look like this? Probably not. It's not that they're going to be more of them. Well, it's going to be like this or whatever. The interesting fact that doing that will bring you to the for forefront of mathematical research circa 1800. It was the most pressing math problem to sort of figure out what the, what the function is from about uh, 1800 to just about uh, 1887, I believe. Uh, so it's very nice. It's a very nice problem. And it's easy. It's actually much easier than it sounds. And then we come to another problem which I want you to do, which is requires some sort of mathematics and experimentation. I want you to do some experimental mathematics. I'm going to define something totally new and unheard of. Palindromic primes. Right? You know what palindromic primes are. They are primes which actually look like palindrome, like 313, 313 is a good palindromic prime. I marked them all. I used my sieve printed first uh, prime, uh, prime numbers in, in, in the first thousand, marked them red. Right? So you could look at them. They're sort of a bunch, many. Can you prove that there is infinite number? No. Uh, we shall see. It's very hard to prove anything about uh, prime numbers and how many, whatever. No, I cannot. But I could, before we go as far as that, let us click here. This is the second thousand. Do you see how many palindromic primes are there? Just comparison. 
first tantrum, second tantrum. That's surprising. I actually stumbled upon this by accident a long time ago, about 20 years ago. And I was shocked because, oh, it's so very weird. Just they all disappear. Maybe they're no more. Maybe they just stop at, what was the last one? 9.29. And it actually leads to some very nice, very, very simple mathematics, if you think about it. So there are the following problems. Are there palindromic primes greater than 1,000? We clearly know there are none between 1,000 and 2,000. But maybe there are some more. And again, you have the code to test it. Just take the sieve, generate as many as you like, look at them carefully. So, well, let's assume that the answer to the first is yes, just for an argument's sake. You probably suspect that. I, I think that most of you say, well, you know, it couldn't just stop at 1,000. There are probably at least one more. So, so what's the reason for the lack of them? Is it just a fluke? Is it a random sort of gap, large gap? Or is there a reason? Now, so you figure out what the reason. And then what happens if we change our base? You see, palindromic prime is not a property of a number as such. It's property of number and its representation. So we were looking at palindromes base 10 in decimal notation. If you go to notation 16, some of you might have heard of such, you know, A, B, Cs, and other things. It goes all the way to F. So uh, it's a joke I heard. Uh, the Google interview, somebody was asked, what is minus 1 in binary? And he said, F. It's true, too. Yeah? So uh, if we change our, so now you're equipped to get a job at Google. So what happens if we change our base to, to 16? Could you somehow predict something? What about an arbitrary base, n? Is there some rule? Think it's a nice problem. Try, try, try to solve it. Again, what I want, I want you to, to sort of acquire we're going to spend three more lectures dealing with prime numbers till we, till we hit RSA. So I want you to become sort of friends, not as close friends as Ramanujan was. You know the story about Ramanujan. You know who Ramanujan was. And you know that according to Hardy, every natural number was his close personal friend. So I don't think you will ever get to that point. No, I will never get to that point. But try to become friends with, with numbers. They're good. And uh, see you on uh, next Wednesday.